All right, you're good to go. Awesome. Okay, great. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for um, attending today. We are super excited. My name is Morgan Barnard, and I am your webinar host with my co-host Emma, as well as marketing problem solver. My primary role is to tell you the story of an industry coming out of COVID-19 slum and sharing the growth of a new business and jobs that we will be creating. My first guest today is Conrad, and he is the director and founder of Rural Creations. Rural Creations helps to transform the tourism sector by assisting communities to create black owned businesses and thus ensuring significant job creation where it is most needed in rural South Africa. The three nonprofit organizations that he is a director of and that Rural, um, Rural Creations provides are the Economic Development Foundation, Africa, Akani Mentors, and Conservation and Wildlife Foundation. These will be going, um, Conrad will be going into more detail about these. So let me hand over to you, Conrad. Thanks very much for the introduction and um, good morning to all. Uh, I'm gonna try and keep it short as I have a, a weakness for talking too much. It's quite tricky because it's quite a lot to digest, but I'm gonna try and simplify it and keep it short today. I'm gonna be talking primarily about three things today. Um, the first thing that I'm gonna talk about is post COVID economy ignition and um, uh, together with a team of professionals, we plan on doing that through commercial community partnerships based on agriculture and tourism. The second thing is our nonprofit initiatives for both the empowerment of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in marginalized communities, including sponsored job placements, and then also conservation initiatives, which give marginalized communities economic opportunity. Um, and then the third thing is I'm just going to touch on the reality and the effects of COVID, um, specifically with reference to the tourism industry. So let me try and um, zoom in on these three things in, in a sort of basic summary form. The first is our um, commercial uh, projects. And I just want to go into a little bit of background, which is that as a result of um, being asked to assist the state in mentoring a community back in 2011, and also being party to a land claim in South Africa, which um, you know lasted for a period of 16 years, um, I realized that I had to proactively as a privileged South African and as a private businessman, get involved in marginalized people in South Africa if I wanted to contribute to the many socioeconomic problems. Specifically, and I'm talking pre-COVID now, the 8 million unemployed youth, and you know, it's it's common knowledge, Standard Bank's figures are 40% unemployment. This was pre-COVID. So with this in mind, I um together with a team of professionals uh, took a decision to develop community partnerships based on economics so it's principally centered, centered around economics and um, move away from the typical one-man type small businesses that I've been involved in over the past. I, I, I then went out in around 2015 and I flew around the Kruger National Park looking for land that was lying fallow or that could be better modeled for the purposes of community beneficiaries. Um, I wanted to identify portions of land that could be utilized for both commercial tourism and commercial agriculture. And I just want to touch on that so that we're clear. So I was specifically looking for individual portions of land that could be developed twofold and or better modeled for both commercial tourism and commercial agriculture from the same piece of land. Um, just a little bit of background, I grew up in Barberton on a farm in Pumalanga and I had many Swazi and Shangan friends as a kid and I learned to speak the Swazi language which has assisted me immensely with what I do. Um, so to come back to the core, I, I have since managed to secure buy-in from 10 communities around the Kruger National Park 
all of whom have um, land that's suitable to commercial tourism and commercial agriculture. Um, we formed two strategic partner companies, and um, I'm going to touch on them now. The uh, tourism strategic partner is a company called Rural Creations, and its sister company is Inclusive Farming. And we formed joint ventures with these 10 communities and um, secured buy-in. And so in, and, and in so doing, we um, managed to secure their land for development. So our model is a structure based on a joint venture agreement where um, rural creations and or inclusive farming own between 26 and 45% shares in the, the joint venture. And the joint venture leases from the community. Um, I say the community, in some cases, it's state-owned land. So the land has um, two uh, ownership uh, models, if you like. The one is that it's been restituted to communities or restored to communities through the land claims um, division in Mpumalanga. And the other is that it's state-owned land where um, we've signed long-term leases with the state. So that's the basic model. Um, although we're working with 10 communities around the Kruger National Park, um, it's our priority at the moment to get our very first project up and running as soon as possible. This is really our showroom and we want to make a statement with this given that things were delayed by COVID quite significantly. Um, the first project is the Mklaba community with the Kwamadwala private game reserve. And I think just let me touch on its needs. It was a, uh, an operating tourism venture before COVID. And as a result of COVID, it closed down. And um, it's our first tourism partnership with the Mklaba community. Uh, they also have an agricultural portion. And um, I just wanna make it clear that these are commercial ventures and um, Conrad and his team in the form of uh, rural creations and inclusive farming are in it for, for money. So we, we're trying to make money ourselves, but it's ambiguous because we also help in rural South Africa and marginalized communities in so doing. We're looking for um, financial aid um, and probably around 15 to 20 million on the tourism side and around 10 million on the agricultural side. I know that it's um, always a question in terms of what's in it for the funder, but there are lots of ways that we can, um, you know, align to the funder and offer accommodation, et cetera, et cetera. We're also putting out commercial stands um, in the reserve. So there's a lot of ways that we can, you know, come to the party on, on that, but it's commercial funding. And um, I also just want to reiterate that the assets belong to the community or the state. Um, I'm gonna stop there on our commercial side and um, I can take questions later or you can email me via Mark. Our second, uh, the second point that I want to talk about is our nonprofit initiatives, which are linked to our commercial initiatives. Um, I say that because um, it's all very well creating jobs in South Africa, but somebody's got to actually ignite engines that are going to create these jobs. And that's where our um, commercial projects come into it. So with the nonprofit entities, we're talking about three nonprofit entities. The first being our Conservation and Wildlife Foundation. The second being um, our Economic Development Foundation. And the third being um, Akani Mentors or Akani NPC, if you like. And um, these nonprofit organizations are linked to our bigger organizations in that we want to ensure that the um, outsourced opportunities, the opportunities in the supply and value chain end up in the hands of these 
um, beneficiaries from these marginalized communities. And it may sound easier than you think, but it's we, we're almost wanting to give them preferential and conditional support in ensuring that that does happen. Uh, our, our Conservation and Wildlife Foundation Africa um, is really an initiative that supports um, conservation that would create opportunity for these communities. So where you've got um, game reserves around the Kruger National Park or game reserves that um, three of our projects can actually be incorporated into the Kruger National Park. Um, we're looking for support in terms of um, the various things that are required in terms of cons conservation, and I can mention a few of them. Um, we're looking at anti-poaching support, um, machinery and equipment, uh, light delivery, four by fours, um, a tractor, a, a TLB, fire equipment, spraying equipment, um, patrol horses, uh, a, a road grader, K9 unit, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the type of things. Um, fencing is a very big cost in most of these cases, and um, it's those type of things. So the conservation side of things forms, to a large extent, a platform for opportunity for these communities going forward. And it is, as I say, either their land or it's the state's land that we're leasing under a 99-year lease. Um, the Economic Development Foundation and the Akani Foundation work very much hand in hand. And I'm just going to go into the first 13 concepts. So when I say they work hand in hand, they're really supporting the same cause, which is entrepreneurship for select qualifying um, people from these marginalized communities. And the Economic Development Foundation specializes in sourcing and funding assets or sourcing and securing funding for these assets or the assets themselves. And the Akani Foundation um, specializes in mentoring and support to the select qualifying applicants. So we're wanting to mentor these applicants for a 36 month period where we give them a protected environment, if you like. And I'm just going to touch on selection because I think a large percentage of the, um, the, the, the role of an entrepreneur is that he or she must want to do it. And I think as a basic rule, I've learned that 5% of society are entrepreneurial in, in, in their mindset. So we're looking for that 5% in any community that are entrepreneurial. And I'm inclined to almost say that it's like it's God given. You are born an entrepreneur within reason. I know the Bill Gates and the Richard Bransons of this world are in a league of their own. But 5% of society as a general rule are entrepreneurial. So in our selection process, we, we go out and we rigorously um, and, and ruthlessly select that, that specific 5% that we believe have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And then we'd like to give them the support through Akani and Economic Development Foundation where we can um, subsidize the assets, if you like. I don't believe in a handout. I think there needs to be responsibility and payback of some of the funds. Um, but I, I want to also give them preferential treatment you know it's no secret that in south africa we have uh, you know many of the privileged society um have had access to second and even third generation funding in some form or another so in these communities akani and economic development foundation want to be that parent figure that can can help them and support them um Lastly, I'm just going to touch on the COVID predicament and, you know, the impact and what I believe is, is currently relevant. Um, the COVID impact is a position that is specifically detrimental to the inbound tourism industry by a significant margin when, you know, when compared to other industries. 
I say inbound tourism, in other words, not domestic tourism, international tourism. And when um, COVID hit, it was almost as though our market had been wiped off the globe. Kwame Dwala, for example, is sole reliant. 95% of its income comes from international inbound tourism. And um, my intention here is to try and give an accurate account of what faces inbound tourism. And then obviously I'm trying to deal with it um, as a survival interim and long-term strategy. Um, what's clear is that inbound tourism industries and their 700,000 plus staff are realistically, and according to experts, and I quote Martin Vist, Vist from Tourvest, he's the CEO from Tourvest, and um, we, we're really facing the next six to 12 months is going to be a crisis survival mode. Um, it's a dire lights out position. There's no income. The industry is in ruins. And um, it is obvious, judging by the many role players who have categorically de declared their dire straits type predicaments, that the position is a national crisis. Um, this position will encompass and ripple its impact on the many supply chain linked major tourism suppliers. And I'm speaking off record when I say that a lot of the major suppliers to the hospitality industry are in trouble. Um, food and beverage, alcohol suppliers, et cetera, are in dire straits. Um, then we're looking at an interim period, which would be 12 to 24 months and a lights on dim or a load shedding position, if you like, um, a lack in infrastructure position. What's, what's important to note here is that um, a lot of the infrastructure has fallen apart. So even though one ignites tourism again and gets facilities operational, a lot of the connecting flights are not operating. A lot of the international flights are not operating. Um, so it's, it's an infrastructure lack position. There'll be... Um, you know, it's it's clear that everyone's trying to tap into the domestic tourism, and domestic tourism is obviously better as a result of COVID because people that would have gone overseas are now supporting local because they they, they really don't have a lot of other options at the moment. Um, but one must also take into consideration, realistically speaking, that SA will not have a large amount of money to spend on leisure in SA, except for, you know, a few very privileged. Um, the domestic leisure tourism is also limited to weekends, long weekends and school holidays in the safari type leisure industry at best. Um, I'm nervous to say the final stage because some are even predicting that it's only going to return to normal levels in 2025. But I think, um, you know, one has to be optimistic and uh, we hope that in the months 24 to 36 from, from now, um, it's, it's expected that things can hopefully return to a sustainable normal or as close to that as possible. possible. Um, as I said, regrettably, we have seen many casualties, liquidations and sequestrations already. This is sadly the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's clear. It's a clear sign that many will simply not recover, and this is distressing news for the SA economy. Just in closure, um, it's worth considering a few points um, which are relevant to the current COVID situation, the proactivity thereof, and um, which I'm going to go into here. The first is the fact that the projects we're doing and the operations thereof are largely subject to the envisaged um, post-COVID pandemic timeline. And unless there, um, you know, unless there's a prolonged position, um, most of our projects will apply to post-COVID. Um, in my opinion, this represents a solution for sustainable ready projects post-COVID and um, with relevance to the dire socioeconomic need thereof. Like I said, we have 8,000 youth unemployed pre-COVID. You know, that's a ticking time bomb in anyone's language. Um, secondly, there, there is and will be a dire need to create sustainable long-term economic support and ignition to areas such as these rural communities 
um, and the poorest of the poor. And it's a greater need to that, to that which there was pre-COVID and an even exponentially greater need applicable to deliver to poor people in, comparis in comparison to the more privileged. Um, on the rural creation sister project side, which is, as I mentioned, led by our um, inclusive farming strategic partner, um, agriculture is combined with tourism as a primary vital industry. Um, it ser serves as an essential complement to the bigger picture, its diversification, and it's a strong model when well diversified. Um, relatively easy to establish and creates immediate jobs in and post COVID. And it also has a second phase in the agro processing, which would kick in, you know, down the line. The reality of launching commercial transformative community tourism models post COVID could not have been better timing in terms of breaking into the marketplace. Um, you know, this taking into account, considering that at best inbound tourism will be in ruins for the foreseeable 24 months. Um, and at such stage that the SA products reopen and or relaunch, one must be able to ensure market share. One must be at the forefront of this process with projects that support our rural communities and the people thereof. Um, this would need to be coupled with aggressive, dynamic, workable marketing, of which one is now afforded the added advantage of having time on our side. Um, and it's no secret that tourism is a sector that displays serious equality imbalances in terms of a previously privileged minority group, if you like. Um, this is the ideal platform for change. Um, we're talking 12,000 jobs, 12,000 sustainable jobs, um, and this gives seriously positive socioeconomic impact as a standalone. Um, the development of any economy is to a large extent reliant on the entrepreneur and small business growth sector, in my opinion. Um, through a significant planning process, we've developed many, many small business concepts. And um, that's, that's our plan, is to ensure that um, these marginalized communities receive a large percentage of the impact. Um, I think I'm going to I'm going to stop there. I, I'm, I'm inclined to get a bit carried away. But anyway, thank you for for listening. Okay, next up, I would like to introduce Mark. So Mark Ashton is a former financial journalist who now heads up business development activities at the Youth Employment Service. His primary role is to build multi-year YES programs that provide integrated solutions, including the YES incentive, enterprise and supplier development, as well as social economic development programs. So thank you, Mark. Thanks, Em. I'm going to stop my video here. I'm going to run a PowerPoint presentation. Firstly, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's, um, it's always nice to be able to put a new project on the table and share some of the success stories that are out there. Uh, for those of you familiar with YES, it's an incentive out of the DTIC, which rewards organizations with a level up on their triple B E scorecard. Um, it's been one of the few success stories. I mean, I think Conrad has, has painted some imagery around the challenges that certain industries have faced, but, you know, YES has been one of those success stories and, and what's quite interesting, I think Emma alluded to it in the, the, the bio and in the introduction, is around the opportunity to start integrating the ecotourism sector into some of your yes implementation, some of your enterprise and supply development opportunities. So we've got a lot of we've got a couple of ideas and thoughts to put down on the table today. Uh, if you've got question and answer, happy to happy to answer them on the fly or at the end when there's a consolidated Q and A. I think we have had so many Zoom and Teams meetings presentations it's always nice to be able to get some uh you know the opportunity to interact rather than just be spoken at so i'm going to run through a quick presentation put some imagery up on the the, the screen and then let me know if you've got specific questions 
So we talk about the, this concept of the great reset. And I think if you look in 2020, the, the world changed for almost all of us. You know, traditional jobs started to disappear. The opportunities in sectors like ecotourism, manufacturing, um, pretty much wherever South Africa was out there, we, we really struggled to be able to find something that was able to be to sustain, the, sustain itself through the 2020 uh, COVID crisis. So the, you know, if you look globally, they do talk of this concept of the great reset, it's reset of industries, it's resets of jobs. So we've got a number of opportunities there. So effectively, this is a challenge that, and, and you know, Conrad mentioned the 8,000 youth that are sitting unemployed in the area pre-COVID. Youth simply can't get a job without experience. They can't get experience without a job. And this concept is something that YES has been trying to tackle. So effectively, what happens is youth get locked out of the workforce. Uh, you know, the definition of a YES youth is somebody 18 through to 35. Now, I get to see a lot of these programs, and it is so you know, insightful and profound when you start looking at these youth programs. And you realize that people simply get locked out of the economy because they don't get that valuable work experience they need straight after school or straight after securing a, a, a qualification. So effectively, yes, provide 12 month quality work experience to unemployed youth. Uh, these youth can do a whole number of things. They can do everything from working inside your organization. We've got youth that we've deployed into some of Conrad's projects uh, where they're doing ecotourism. And I'll take you through, and I think Emma's got some imagery of that, and we'll talk about that shortly. But I mean, effectively, the problem that youth have, we mentioned, is that they don't have the work experience. But people are not prepared to take a chance on somebody they don't know. So by having going through a 12 month work experience, they end up with a CV, a reference letter, all these things that make them so much more employable down the line. So 12 month work experience, rewarding organizations with a level up on their BE scorecard. Uh, just some indication around impact, 54,350 jobs as of yesterday afternoon, 1,400 partner companies participating, 3 billion in new salaries. And, and what's very cool about that particular stat is that the money is not going into traditional you know, economic power centers. So if you look at the way the South African economy is made up, you've got Gauteng and you've got the Western Cape, or more specifically Cape Town, and very much is a concentration of money. What's very cool is you know for instance uh you know we've got some imagery just now of 14 youth that have been hosted by an organization or sponsored by an organization that sits in Gauteng but is out there putting salaries into areas where there simply aren't jobs and new jobs being created and you know if you if you sit in Santon and you're trying to survive on 3760 which is national minimum wage it is incredibly difficult to be able to make that money last in a community where these external money is flowing into local communities makes the world a difference. So I think when you start looking at these programs, make sure that you look, consider the, the impact of not having concentration sitting inside uh, places like Gauteng, Western Cape, et cetera. Um, interesting stat, also 42% yes youth absorption rate. A lot of people are very surprised when they hear this. And I think it just speaks to the point of, uh, you know, the earlier comment, the moment you start to trust a youth working inside your organization, they've got absorption opportunities. And, the, you know, remember absorption could be that they get permanent work uh, offering, they could set up their own small businesses. Um, you know, 42% of those youth, and remembering the legislation only requires 2.5% of absorption, it really does talk to a lot of the, the, the power behind that early work experience. Um, in terms of whether the incentive works or not, over 400 B level ups have already been rewarded, awarded. So if you don't know the legislation that came into being back in 2019, there was a lot of question marks about whether verification agencies would pick up and run with it. It's been incredibly successful. They're very familiar with it. And Level Up's now awarded. And then remember, all these youth end up with, yes, smartphones. So they get eight minutes. So we've done over 8 million learning minutes on those phones. And this really does just simply empower youth to be able to get access to the market, uh, access to information and learning skills, which could be everything from personal finance, soft skills, building digital CVs, et cetera. I'm going to quickly run you through how the uh, legislation works, so that, and then I'll get into a more practical example. Um, YES has got one of three ways that you can calculate your target, uh, depending on your type of entity and which industry you're in. You can achieve one of three things. One, a, a full level up on your BE scorecard. 
Uh, remember there, you only require two and a half percent of absorption. Second option is one level up plus three bonus points. And we're seeing quite a lot of people that are quite interested in that as a setup. Uh, so there you'll need to do one and a half times your target. So if your yes target was 10, uh, this would require you to employ 15 youth and absorb 5% of that yes target. And then lastly, the second one, the third option is to do two full levels on your BE scorecard. And that's an incredibly powerful jump if you think about it when you compare other investments, whether it is um, change in ownership, um, ESD programs, et cetera. So there's a number of ways to look at yes uh, in terms of implementing yes and the outcomes for it. Um, you, nice thing here, yeah, and I think we can talk about some of the, the opportunities and I'll, I'll spend when, when we move on to later slides, uh, you can integrate with your ESD programs, uh, Section 18A certificates. I know Conrad's got a couple of not-for-profit companies that are that are in his cluster. Yes, is able to issue Section 18 certificates. Uh, there's ESD, there's socioeconomic development, um, and you can claim the employment tax incentive. So there's a number of different ways to be able to attract funding into the, the creation of these uh, jobs. Uh, you can also get informal skill spend. So the 50% of skill spend in categories F and G uh, which is very handy and if you're looking for options there. Um, you know, what are the benefits of putting uh, youth into your business? Uh, Conrad's talking about rebuilding company, country and youth. I mean, this is exactly what YES is doing, fresh new ideas and skills into your business. Try out your YES cohorts and select the best fit, build and support SMEs and entrepreneurs. Uh, creating future capacity in taxpayers. I mean, you know, we were just looking this morning at the, the burden that South African taxpayers are under. And the only way that we can really grow is by introducing new investors, by introducing new small businesses and effectively creating new taxpayers. So when you look at yes, there's a, there's, there's a knock on impact to all of these investments and contributions in terms of time. Um, sector trendsetter, walk the path of an economic recovery. Conrad's outlined some of the challenges that the, his specific sector has, has spoken around. You've got the opportunity to get in front of the trends. And I mean, you know, we, we did a flyover of the Kruger Park probably four or five weeks ago, and it was completely dead. There were so few cars on the road. Two, two weeks back, we went there to go and have another look and see what was happening. And you could see the economy was really switching on. And, I, and while I, I think Conrad has painted a picture of a, an industry that has taken a beating, you know, what is kind of encouraging for us is that there are some green shoots coming through. And that if you are early to the, to, to the party and early to go and grow these initiatives, you'll be able to go and introduce some of the, you, you'll be able to set a trend and be at the forefront of some of these developments as they're coming through. And I mean, I think tourism ultimately is one of these things that South Africa is, is good at. We, it's something that we can attract foreign investment into. It just requires a concerted and targeted and concentrated effort to be able to build these businesses and youth work experiences. So I've, I've spoken a little bit about yes. I'm going to give you a practical example. Some of your first option is that you can place youth inside your own business. So these are internal placements. Uh, you could put youth at an existing yes partner. So this is an example of these youth that we that I mentioned that are working in some of Conrad's projects. You'd be able to deploy youth into those. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about contracting frameworks, because I think this is one of the reasons that we, we find a lot of interest from corporates who struggle to host these youth internally. Uh, one of the nice things is you're able to go and put youth onto other organizations' payrolls and simply become the corporate sponsor for them. That means you don't need to expand your headcount, so you don't incur additional uh, skill spend requirements. So a number of opportunities to go and host youth at, at existing YES partners. And then you can have a look at some of the YES hubs. There's some discussions around hubs in that, in that area, a very early stage. And I think COVID has, has put some of those things on the back foot. But maybe my next slide will give you some ideas of a very, very good example of how you can integrate entire spend across a, a number of these corporates and support organizations, such as what Conrad is doing. So those of you might be familiar with Blossom Care Solutions, uh, this is a very cool initiative and it's one that's, that, that's proving very popular at the moment. Effectively, organizations fund the setup of a sanitary pad manufacturing facility. The sanitary pad manufacturing facility typically houses uh, between six and eight yes youth. They will work inside this as part of their yes work experience. They'll be under supervision. So the initial investment to set up one of these hubs, one of these um, uh, micro franchises 
is a is an enterprise or supply development recognition and then you can build in things like socioeconomic development so what's quite what's happening quite regularly at the moment is that organizations will invest in the hub the the, the franchise they'll, they'll host the youth or fund the youth and then they'll buy it, commit to offtake agreements which are then donated to the local community and, and one of the projects that we're currently finalizing with uh, with Conrad and with his team is to put one of these into the local area and be able to go and support small businesses who will then be able to small a small business and then have offtake agreements for them so this is just some imagery of some of the equipment it's a real world business i think um you know conrad mentioned earlier about moving away from this kind of one man survival business through to something a bit more sustainable this is just some ideas of things that you can have a look at um in in terms of integrating something like blossom into into your planning for for your clients um the uh, this just kind of talks a little bit more about blossom but you know we're seeing quite a lot of organizations now building this in either as part of their mining social labor plans or the ED plans, and they're very much adopting multi-year views in terms of deploying these projects into their uh, into their communities. Um, some other just other opportunities that you'd be able to look at if you want to fund in the in the area in conjunction with some of um, Conrad's projects, we have uh, a spa opportunity to be able to uh, put in a, a black owned micro enterprise spa to be able to support um, uh, kind of the, the the lifestyle elements of the of the community. We've got a low cost, low water laundry solution, uh, which was actually initially piloted in the mining community. Uh, you'd have the opportunity again, remember any of these projects you'd be able to put Yes Youth into and be able to kind of envisage them doing real work experience. Um, and, and the reason I just wanted to put these here is also, you know, we often get asked about the type of work that Yes Youth can do. Um, we've got shuttle and tourism solutions, lodge security and rejuvenation projects, which is what, um, you know, Conrad was talking about in terms of the canine units, uh, the horse patrols, etc. cetera. Uh, very interesting drone pilot training initiative. So being able to do drone pilot training for youth. Uh, we've run a very successful one in Saldana at the moment. Uh, what's quite interesting there is, again, the type of job that these youth are doing. It is not a case of simply doing a, um, you know, an entry level, dig a hole, fill a hole, expand a public works type project. These drone pilots are able to do things like ecotourism, uh, geo geographic mapping, uh, security, etc. So the, the uh, tourism concessions, so you, you're looking at uh, quad biking solutions, you're looking at things like uh, micro lighting or other um, trips into the Kruger and then kind of community financial education initiatives. So, I mean, we've spoken about what Akani is doing for supporting entrepreneurs. Uh, you can also do things like um, uh, financial wellness and financial education solutions that you'd be able to look at there. Um, just some imagery again. You, you you can you can do everything from the, the the spa solution all the way through to an agriculture solution. And there are so many different ways to look at yes and think about it from integrating into their pro into your programs rather than simply saying, well, I'm going through a checkbox exercise uh, for for a little bit of BE. You can do some really high impact jobs at a time when the country really needs it and the sectors really need it. And yeah, we're really looking forward to working with organizations around these projects. I'm going to stop there for a moment and just see if there are any questions that have come through and whether anybody has um, thoughts around how they would integrate these projects into uh, projects into their initiatives. I've got a couple of Q&A, so I'll also try and address those as well at the same time, specifically around yes, um, and then also have a look at the um, any other questions that might, might have come through. First question I've got here, and it comes up quite regularly, relates to the cost of putting yes into uh, in, in terms of the yes youth stipend. So just a reminder, yes is a 12 month work experience. So it does give the youth a full 12 month work experience. You can pay the national minimum wage, which is 3,760. Uh, you do have the option of providing top up funding for that. Uh, we've seen, I mean, kind of the salaries, I've seen everything all the way up to 16,000 Rand. Um, you know, we've, we've run some programs as well, 
where the intent is to gamify the youth. I mean, Conrad spoke about this idea of building entrepreneurs. If the entrepreneurs don't have the, the this mindset that they can go beyond earning the, the, the national minimum wage, they very quickly kind of get adopt a view that they're simply going through the motions. So the work experience, but the opportunity to also earn more is, is quite an important um, opportunity there. Um, do organizations come back and participate on multiple times with yes, absolutely they do we've got a number of organizations that are entering their third and fourth year of participation with yes. What I really wanted to kind of highlight there and emphasize there is the opportunity to be able to integrate with the um, with, with your kind of solutions over multiple years. I think too often we adopt this view that kind of yes is a short term box ticking exercise. By adopting a longer term view or around these yes implementations, you are able to go and say, I, I want to do, I, I've got an actual growth path for these youth. I think the worst situation you can end up in is a situation where youth uh, get their 12 month work experience and then 90 to 95% of the cohort simply drop off and aren't able to follow through. Uh, third question here relating to yes is can we create can yes youth be absorbed into small businesses the answer is yes they can so if you look at the clarification statement that came out in uh, 20, February 2020 youth can be absorbed into a small business as an enterprise and supplier development beneficiary there are a number of ways that you can do it and I think that this is where the opportunity to work with somebody like Conrad where he's got quite good understanding of the local communities and the understanding of actual you know where there's the local supply and demand there's no use setting up an enterprise development beneficiary where we don't actually have a have an actual understanding of what the value chains in the area are uh, follow up question here, and I, and I think this one that Conrad, I'm going to throw to you as well, but I've got a very high level answer, but I, but I think I want you to also come in here. Um, you know, looking at these projects, is there quite a high level of community engagement and how important is community engagement? Uh, my kind of high level answer with a yes hat on is looking at some of the projects we do with the mining communities. There is so much community engagement that has to happen. You have to be able to talk to the local community. They have to understand your, your strategy and your goal. Um, and you need to be able to communicate. And it's everything from where are youth recruited to where are small businesses being set up? Are there offtake agreements that are gonna benefit the communities? Uh, Conrad, maybe you wanna come in here and quickly just talk a little bit around the importance of community engagement and you know actually understanding the local i mean you you've spoken about the different communities around but the time and effort that goes into that kind of engagement and project management yeah thanks mark and i think it's a very uh important question and i'd like to just um try and answer it as comprehensively as possible I think um, I know with a lot of funders today, uh, you know, just to mention IDC as one, um, you know, they hear the word community or community partnership and the red flags jump up, you know, they see conflict, they see fire, they see a whole lot of things. And unfortunately, a lot of community projects have failed. Um, and I think it it comes back to this very question that's that's been posed, and and that's how are they engaged? And I think um, you, you know you've had a um, once had a lot of uh, social projects, if you like, that um, don't necessarily always fly. But to answer your question, um, we work with ten communities and. They are usually represented by a what they call a CPA, Communal Property Association, or a trust. Um, you've got to be careful on the trust, and you've got to make sure that the trust deed um, aligns to protection of the community. This is a community trust. It's not a private trust or a family trust or a it's a community beneficiary trust. And you've got to be careful of the documentation that's involved. Um, regrettably, there's been a lot of corruption and I'm not pointing a finger. There have been community leaders that have been corrupt. There have been um, strategic partners that have been corrupt, mainly because it's the ideal platform in which to capitalize. But um, 
to come back to the question, we don't take any major decision without mass community participation. So, you know, we don't just rely on the community leaders, although in most cases they are um, mandated and authorized to take decisions. Um, if it's any major decision regarding projects or land or anything like that, we call mass meetings and we put these mass meetings on video and we take attendance registers and we make sure that, um, that you know, most of the uh, legal requirements state that you need 75% vote of mass community beneficiaries in order to you know pass a resolution but we actually like to have at least 95 percent um it's it's optimistic thinking to think that you're going to have total 100 percent there's always somebody that's perhaps not 100 percent in alignment with what the majority want to do but to answer your question we deal with the mass community <clears throat> and that's the level of engagement so yeah, it's not about talking to leaders. It's about talking to the people. And um, the communities that that we deal with total um, around 30,000 people, um, most of these communities vary between 1,000 and 5,000 beneficiaries. Um, in other words, households, including households. So you might have one beneficiary represented, but that um, person represents a household of between five and ten people and um, so that, that yeah to answer your question um, our engagement uh, we, 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 we cautious legally because we want to be able to always substantiate that we have communicated and um, to answer your question the um, involvement of communities comes back to one word and that's communication and what I've learned and I've watched um, land being restored to communities since 2004 in Mpumalanga, and I've watched huge conflicting scenarios. And I think what's, what's evident in all of these scenarios is that you have to communicate. You need an open forum. If one beneficiary out of 5,000 needs a question attended to and answers, then he, he or she must have a platform to get those answers and get them uh, quickly. I'm not saying that you know you need to leave the joint ventures financial statements lying around, but you need to answer those questions and there needs to be an open book, transparent policy in place. And um, they need, the, the leaders need to be workshopped on this and also workshopped on their roles as custodians of the communities rather than kingpins who are there to make a large amount of money and uh, the problems relate to um, one man or woman being upset about something or having a very pertinent question and it not being attended to this week so he or she's by the end of the the next month quite angry and they've got he or she has got 10 or 12 people with her now and it it spirals out of control shortly there's chaos so it's about dealing with communication of mass beneficiaries regularly and transparently um, it's not an overnight matter it's taken me um, the good part of six years to um, formulate the ventures that we have with total buy-in and as i say you know with total support evident on on file you know in videos and in documentation thank you conrad um, i am cognizant of time here so i'm going to throw it back to our hosts ladies thank you very much for the opportunity to present and thank you again to all the guests who have joined us today um emma morgan will you guys jump in yeah, so I'm going to introduce Emma now. She's the project consultant assisting the job creation initiatives and capital raising 
Emma will share the yes you stories and put a human face to the investments in this project. Um, for any questions further on this webinar, you can contact Emma by her email address and she'll be leading all queries post this webinar. So her email address is emma at decasatio.co.za, but we'll give that information. It's also in the webinar description. Emma, over to you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for the introductory. And uh, my name's Emma. So I had the opportunity to visit Kwamadala and I was able to meet and interview some of the youth who are currently working with the YES initiative there. So currently the youth there are focused on manual labor and being exposed to skills such as grinding, welding, maintenance and fencing. And they are also being trained in handling the animals at the lodge. Um, as well as once the poaching unit there is established, those individuals who fit the criteria and are able to function under pressure will receive training in advanced rifle handling as well as assisted in their competencies. So furthermore, the youth there are being trained in hospitality, bartending and setup, as well as learning skills and housekeeping and front of house duties. Obviously these require a uh, level of interpersonal skills as well as computer skills. So in having met and interviewed the youth, it was great to really see the impact that the YES program is having. Um, so they value the skills that are being learned as well as the opportunity to make money for their families in the local communities. Um, this is not just a skills development opportunity, but um, as Mark spoke on, there is um, the 42% absorption rate. And in speaking with management, um, the objective is essentially to absorb the youth so that they may uh, fill long-term permanent positions at Kwamadala. So yes, thank you so very much for letting me present. And um, yes, it's definitely a great opportunity to invest in. Thanks, Em. I appreciate that. Um, okay, cool. I'm going to share my screen now as well. And just, I think, to um, kind of uh, package it all to one place. Thank you for joining us. And going back to what um, Conrad said about the 13 communities, these images here show you uh, the 13 concepts. Sorry. These images are the foundations of what was going to be these uh, 13 concepts, which would have been opportunities for bush restaurants, elephants experiences, horse safaris, convenience stores, traditional culture video, um, village, curio shops, uh, the um, foundations for also the sanitary pad, which Blossom Care, were, um, which Mark mentioned on. Um, they want to be doing bee and honey experiences from live performances, bakeries, local breweries, zip line, tour operations. This whole, um, this whole can all be done and donated through the Section 18A and the benefits of this can be from the Section 18A tax certificate, which um, you can be, and can be done in cash or equipment format. So with the Economic Development Foundation, that is more aligned with assets as what Conrad mentioned as well. And then with the Akani Mentors, that is with um, developing the skills of the people. So um, yeah, these are the foundations of what was going to be that. And Post-COVID, we this is the, the 13 opportunities we want to start with. Um, yeah, and then just looking at the community as well as um, put it, creating job creation and then the wildlife and conservation side of things. They have beautiful elephants on the farm um, of Kwamadwala and just looking at how um, to reduce the um, conflict, human versus wildlife conflict that um, can be faced when owning a, uh, when there is a reserve like this. So there are a lot of farms around and just making sure that the elephants are safe, want to be introducing rhinos and making a haven for rhinos to be on the property. Um, so this can be done with fencing. The, as Conrad mentioned, the anti-poaching unit um, and the canine units. So yeah, just to wrap it up, that is what we are looking at. Thank you. And I think we'll be taking questions now. Mark, do you have any more questions your side? 
Uh, I've just got one question here relating to um, you know, setting up uh, follow-ups around discussions around how committing to enterprise and supply, the enterprise and supply development initiatives. Um, I mean, obviously, this involves bringing in a number of partners. You've probably got your BE consulting firm. You may have an enterprise and supply development partner who's working with you. Uh, we are very familiar with drawing up these agreements, working with the, the local organizations. So, yeah, I mean, from my side, I think it's very simple. Get in touch with one of us. We'd be happy to set, to, uh, set up a meeting and, and talk you through the options. Uh, we can build some bespoke opportunities for you. I think, you know, the, the, your lever will always be the, the, the triple B incentives around these things. And I'm happy to work with anybody. You can either get hold of me, myself or Emma, and we'll be happy to set something up for you. Um, again, thank you very much to everybody for your time. And hopefully we get to share some of these opportunities with you and report back in three, six, 12 months time to show you the progress and, and some of the human story there. So Morgan, thank you very much for the time. Sure thing. Thank you to all the speakers and panelists. If you have any more queries or you want to know any more information about this, please um, do um, email Emma with all your queries and the four of us will get back to you with the answers to that. But yeah, that is all from me. Thanks, Conrad, for joining us. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the delegates and guests. Thanks very much to everyone. Thank you.